So what has changed for you and what do people need to know going forward about how to support Sawdust City? Uh, well, our saloon is obviously closed down, which is our on-site uh, bar. We can't have anybody in there. We still have our retail open to curbside uh, and in-store pickup to a maximum of two people inside. But that really hadn't changed. It was pretty minimal. We hadn't really opened up very much. We until we, we didn't want to make any big changes until there were big changes because, uh, you know, it's been a bit of a yo-yo year. Yeah. So anytime you make a bold move, chances are it's going to blow back in your face. So we sort of just played it safe. Uh, as for our online ordering, it's still going strong. Uh, yeah, we ship out Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can get anything online and uh, deliver it fresh to your door. And then we have the LCBO beer store and grocery store still selling out. So uh, basically, uh, other than if you want the in-person stuff, uh, the rest of our you know products are still available where they were yesterday. So uh, we'll keep going until they tell us to completely stop. <laughs> and Sam, it's got to be frustrating because every small business owner that I've spoken to, it's the up and down, right? It's the, hey, we're on lockdown, we're not on lockdown. That's the most frustrating thing. Uh, for you, how have you guys been able to deal from the first lockdown back in 2020 to where we are now? Well, the first one was like that big, scary, everyone didn't know what was happening. And we let everybody go, but then everybody came back eventually. Uh, summer was relatively normal because we have a pretty big outdoor space. And let's be honest, when you're in Muskoka, you want to be outside anyways. And, you know, then when the second wave hit in December, we've been pretty much, we decided that unless we can have a full or 50, at least 50% open in our saloon, we weren't going to open anyways. Uh, it's not necessarily very busy up in right here right now because, uh, you know, cottage season's still a ways away. And so we really haven't, the last, the changes that did come, other than we went gray, red, gray, lockdown fuller lockdown over the last you know month <laughs> it's crazy we just sort of barely moved because we, uh, we did i mean unfortunately hire a few people back in those six days <laughs> which then turned around like we couldn't hire them back yeah. but that's the frustrating part but other than that like you know we didn't want to make any big moves because you know we're fool me once shame on me situation so we're just waiting until everything finally opens up fully before I think we make any big moves. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I also have been thinking about this in terms of the way that Canadian football fans are going to return back to their old norm, if you want to call it that. And it's something I think that we all think about individually on our day-to-day -day right now is just what was the old norm, right? Like trying to figure out what, what was that? How did that feel? How do we, so I'm wondering for you what the emotions will be when whether it's everyone's fully vaccinated or the provincial health restrictions get dropped because we're in a much better place or they announce, hey, global pandemic, vast majority of it, so whatever it is where you're allowed to say the saloon's open, you know, the retailing store is open, we don't have to do the curbside stuff. We are back to what we used to treat as our norm. What is that going to feel like to you? Because I, I've been thinking about seeing the turnstiles open at a CFL stadium and seeing 27,000 people go through the gates and sit close to each other again. And I'm like, that feels a ways away. But at the same time, the first time I see it, I'm going to have to keep rubbing my eyes and, and going, no, it's, it's real. Like we're, we're back to actually doing this stuff. You know, I, I think it's the same thing earlier that when we had that first little bump into normality where they open things up for a second, I walked into the saloon and for the first time in many, many months, there was actually, you know, humans in there. And I, it actually was quite jarring because I had been so used to this empty cavernous space and just to see people was nice. And I think that'll be the, you know, it'll be refreshing to be able to see a room full of people. And if you had asked me two years ago, if I ever wanted to go to a beer festival again, I probably would have said no, <laughs> but my God, I want to go to a beer festival right now. And, and pour beer and talk to people about the same thing 600 times in four hours. I mean, that would be a welcome change to never talking about anything. <laughs> uh, Sam, we have obviously uh, some flavors in uh, front of me of, uh, of beer. What's your creative process in terms of creating um, different styles of beer? And how does this suit the marketplace? Because different marketplaces have different wants. Uh, you know, it, sometimes it starts with, uh, you know, one beer leads to the idea of another beer and you could take that any way you, you like. I mean, sometimes we'll be drinking a certain beer a number of times and uh, a crazy idea will pop in or 
it, the ideation starts at many different points. Like with binary, I see there, I just like the idea. It was actually like a Star Trek episode and they were talking about a binary system and two things. And, and I thought about two different things and we could, how, how different this binary would be. <laughs> so there, there's that one. Little Norway started because uh, some Norwegians called us and asked us to design a Canadian type beer. And that's how they put it. Wow. And then they flew over to Norway and they pitched us this story that was very similar to, let's say, a very large Canadian brand. And we said, oh, well, we can't do that. <laughs> so we told them this story about how Gravenhurst was Little Norway. And the Norwegian pilots came over to, to, to Gravenhurst in the, in the 1940s to learn how to fly to go back to occupied uh, Norway and fight the Germans. So did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> They were sitting in this marketing meeting. And they're like, yes, that is a much better story. So, it was, and it was just coincidence that they called us. And I, growing up in Bracebridge, the town over, I didn't even know that story. It, Rob brought it up and I'm like, wow, that, that couldn't have been more coincidental and perfect. So out of that came this beer, Little Norway, uh, that started from a call from a Norwegian advertising company asking us to make a beer. That's amazing. Well, before we do anything else, it's time to crack these bad boys because it's been too long here into the show. It's been too long. There we go. Into the day uh, that I think we need to get some of this in. So I, I admit, I'm not going to pretend, oh, hey, Sam, this is the first time I've ever had this. Can you tell me about it? I've had a bunch of these. They're, they're delicious. They're wonderful. They're extremely, extremely refreshing is the first thing that jumps out to me, which I'm assuming with a Pilsner, that's something that is a bit of a hallmark for you, is it not? Yeah, you, this is a beer that you want to be able to have you know, every day, whether you're just finishing mowing the lawn or coming in from whatever sporting event you're doing. And or just with a meal like it's Pilsners or lagers, that is, make up about 70 percent of the world's beer style. So like it's it is the most famous beer style in the world. I think when a lot of us got into craft beer, it was a rejection of the lager or the Pilsner style. But like anything, uh, you sort of as you get older, your your styles get more refined and your fl- and you really start to get the nuance and you know, the delicate balance that goes on within uh, a well-made Pilsner or a lager. And it took me a while to get back there. Like it's where I started. And then 16 years later, it's where I came back to, Uh, you know, learning in Germany. uh, It's obviously something that they take a lot of pride in. And this is very much a German style pills uh, in that it's, it's light pale color, very uh, well attenuated, which means it's dry. Uh, a little bit of hop bitterness and some uh, light aromatic spicy hop notes, uh, which is what we use all traditional German uh, malt and hops to create this and follow a very regimented uh, lagering profile. So like it takes us about eight to 12 weeks to make this beer, whereas some of our other ales might take as quick as uh, 12 to 20 days. Wow. Wow. Um, Number one, um, Little Norway, very good. It was the first time I actually tried this one. Um, when I made the video, I tried the little the you liar. One. You lie, Kyle Mel. You've had 20 of them. You had 20 <laughs> yesterday. No. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, very good. Um, you were telling the story around uh, little Norway. Do, does every one of your 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 flavors have a story behind it? Uh, we try to include a story. We feel that, you know, as as beer makers, we're part of the entertainment industry and we feel like uh, we, uh, we should offer some form of entertainment or a story to tell while if you're drinking it, you can discuss that story or uh, where it came from. And we feel that's important because, you know, you're supposed to be fun and you're doing if you're drinking, sometimes it's just, you know, a relaxing thing to get away from reality. And we want to be part of that entertainment. Um, we had a whole series of beers called the Winewood series where we would take a picture and then the picture would uh, I'd ask. Uh, I'd sort of tell a story to my art director and then say, take a picture around this story. And then we fit it to a beer. And it was always of an employee. And that story revolved around the beer. It was a whole idea. And I I quite like that. We haven't done one in a while, but I love doing that because it's, you know, it's fun. It's a creative process and allows you sort of get out of the box of making the same thing over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. This now you mentioned this is a German style uh, pilsner because of the certain aspects that go into it. But I'm wondering when they they get a hold of you in Norway and they say, "Hey, we're wondering about a Canadian style." What what do you label as a Canadian style 
version of whether it be a Pilsner or a beer in general, like what, what would you say that people worldwide recognize us as and the reason that they obviously came to you? Well, they said the, the reason they came to us uh, as Canadians is like Norwegians actually, they have a, a strong affinity for Canadians. They think they were these rugged mountain men and, uh, you know, they appreciate the relationship we had stemming back to World War II um, in so much as even they've designed their liquor store after our LCBO, which is just crazy. Really? They just call it, <laughs> yeah, they call it the wine monopoly, though. They just straight up call it the wine monopoly. <laughs> but like they, they were they, they just wanted to they wanted this Canadian type beer, which neither Rob and I really could pin down what that meant. But I think they wanted the idea of the story more than the style. Uh, they just wanted a generic uh, lager that they could sell at the grocery store and promote it as being Canadian. And so what they actually did is they just Googled Canadian beer. And because Rob also owns the Canadian Bring Awards, his face came up and that's how they found him. Nice. And so they said, do you know a brewery that would come over? And he's like, well, I might know one. And so on the plane, we went to Norway and the beer that we made there was slightly more middle of the road. It wasn't as hoppy. It was a little less alcohol. Uh, and uh, a little bit more straightforward. And that was fine. That's what they wanted. But when we came back here, our market was a little bit more discerning when it came to craft loggers. So we wanted to make it a little bit more uh, refined and a little bit more delicate and higher, sort of just a higher quality, I guess you could put it that way. Uh, Sam, my conversations with people down south is craft beer, the industry down there is few and far between. But in Canada, we've seen such a rise and craft beer, you know, breweries and, and manufacturers for you. Can you explain the rise over the last decade in, you know, craft beer and, and all these little breweries, you know, gaining some notoriety in the mar marketplace? Well, I think it, you know, actually it does come from a lot from the States. A lot of craft beer in the world is driven through the U S yeah. they, they sort of like, at least my generation of craft beer got a lot of their inspiration from what was happening uh, a lot in California uh, at the time and throughout the U.S. And we would go down to the Craft Brewers Conference and come back with this, you know, oh, my God, what are they doing? It's crazy. We got to do this. And I think a lot of us, as, as the, that snowball started to, to develop and get bigger and bigger, the story got out and everyone, you know, you tell your friend, he tell his friend. Like I was saying last week when we talked, it was 35 breweries when I got here back from germany in 2006 and now we're over 400 like just over 15 years later and you know every it's it's i think people just wanted they wanted to change from the large macro beers but they also they realized they had choice and they want to support locals so if you have a friend who owns a brewery like they want to support that friend and also just by the fact that we got better at doing it and over the last 15 years, you know, it's not, you can't just open a brewery and sell. You have to open a brewery and you have to be not only good brewers, but you have to be good marketers and good businessmen. And, you know, it's a very demanding industry right now. And I think there's so many great breweries in Ontario that the quality has reached a very, like a pinnacle that I never thought I'd see. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you saying that because, again, I just because of the nature of how my mind works and how much football work I do during the day, looking at things and talking about things around the game. It reminds me a lot, and Kyle, we've been talking a lot lately about the ratio, right? About the Canadian yeah. content and having that in the CFL and what happens if the CFL and the XFL look at some sort of collaboration. And the thing that always jumps out to me is we want to be able to have Canadians playing our game, but they also have to be good enough. And that's what jumps out to me about this whole Canadian craft beer conversation and specifically Ontario that you talk about, Sam, is there's a lot of this, well, you know, I'll, I'll buy it because it's down the street or I'll buy it because it's local or I'll buy it because... No, man, you're buying it because it's damn good. Like, that's the thing that I think people have come around on is realizing, no, we have a world-class craft beer community that's been developed here. And I even know this. I mean, Kyle talks about going to places in the States. I go down to NASCAR races once in a while and Watkins Glen, New York and all the rest. And they have all the, the vineyards that are around there at the Finger Lakes. And I try some of the beers there and I'm like, okay. Sure. I'm like, but it doesn't really like hit it for me. And I, that's just me. Everybody's different, but I'm extremely thankful for the way that the Ontario craft beer community has evolved. And as you say, reach that pinnacle. Uh, it's, it's such a unique experience to go to the LCBO and to try a variety of a favorite type of beer. I went through one winter, Sam, where I was, I just decided I'm going to try every IPA in here. 
Like I'm, I'm just going to buy, I'm going to buy one of everything here. And I know that it gets rotated throughout the you know seasons. Otherwise when they're buying in on the shelves to be there, but I said, I'm going to try one of everything. And I came away from it loving three or four different beers that I never thought I would have. And you look back on it, you go, the fact that I had enough options to pick three or four that I really fell in love with is pretty stunning. Yeah. It, it's, it's come a long way. Like there, I, I, one of the sort of like old jokes is like, there used to be like this Ontario, pale ale style which was a very malt forward not a lot of hops middle of the road generic amber beer and how far we've come from that although like sometimes i find myself really really wanting that specific style like a a late 90s early 2000s ontario pale ale like it's something that's ingrained in me to be and want but like it was good that it went away for a long time and people moved past that and got into experimenting with more styles. And that was one of the things that really drew me to beer was that there was this almost infinite amount of different styles you could do and practice with and try. And to it, one thing I do find about a lot of American breweries that I do get a little sad about is that they've gone almost back to a, a monoculture of one style, which is just IPA. So if you go to a brewery, they'll have, nine taps, eight are IPAs and one's a stout. And you're like, Oh, I, like, I, I, I kind of long for the days where there was like, you go, there's a lager, there's a Saison, there's a, there's a stout, there's an IPA, there's a pale ale, there's a whip beer, like any style you want. And that's what we wanted to bring at Sada city is like, we have 18 taps and we'll have seven or eight different styles running at any time. So there's something for everyone. And uh, we want to give that opportunity for people to try and have that variety and, you know, in those East style, there's also like a little bit of history and a little in a story to tell about where it came from, uh, what country it came from and how that style developed. And I think, you know, a lot of my world history is based around the history of beer and where it came from and how, uh, you know, it came to be. And it tells a lot about the people that brewed it. And I, I, I find that super interesting. I uh, just before you ask the last question here, Kyle, I, I, I'm just imagining a world going forward here where instead of teaching kids, you know, well, we have grade nine history and then we have grade 10 history. And it's like, well, here's what happened in World War One. Next year we do World War Two. I would love if there was just like an optional class in grade 11, grade 12, as you're getting to where it's like, here's beer history. And you're just you're looking through the guise of, OK, let's look at all the labels on the cans. Let's look at all the experiences from around the world and let's understand it through that prism, because I imagine that gives you such a unique view at a lot of things because it's all intertwined into the history of something that has been so communal for so long. Well, it's for sure. And like, I think, and when you delve, you delve into it and you learn the history, you find that, you know, maybe this, the style Pilsner, let's take that for example, is a, this is a German Pils. And it, you might argue that all Pils are German because even though the first Pilsner style was brewed in the Czech Republic, the now Czech Republic, it was by a German brewmaster. And you can get in, you sort of learn about how the borders in Europe changed. And I learned a lot about that history through studying the beer and where it came from and how it changed not just borders but like people's perceptions and it it definitely would be an interesting class and i think it's one worthy that you'd learn a lot uh you could take a lot of different you could do that with rum or tea or coffee probably too and you'd come up with a very interesting different perspective of the world Sam, you talk about all these stories behind the history of beer, but how is important not only for Sawdust City, but any brewery to connect to the local community that they operate in? Oh, it's, I think it's one of the first things you have to do. If you, you know, that's why at Sawdust, all of our beers sort of speak about the area. Um, I'm from here and it really means a lot to me to, you know, be a part of the community. And we wanted Sawdust to be a community hub. That's why we have the saloon where people can come. We host a lot of events, live music. We do paint nights, trivia nights. We want, you know, people to know they can come to Sawdust. And it's a place open to everyone, uh, completely, uh, you know, inclusive of everybody. And uh, the more we have a, a club on the wall called our Mug Club where, uh, you know, local people can store their mug on the wall and come back and it's theirs. It's on the wall. They come in, it's like they're number 46 and they just take their mug and they sit down and they relax. And it's a place that, you know, they can call home and they're proud that the brewery is part of their home community. 
That is amazing. Uh, I do think that at some point, all of these conversations are just going to end up in me living up in Muskoka because you keep making it sound better and better every time that I come on and <laughs> hang out with you. But uh, it is Little Norway. It is today's tasting again. Pilsner, 4.7%. You can get it all over the place. The beautiful red can there with the uh, the pine trees that you see sitting behind Sam Corbe, brewmaster and co-founder of Sawdust City Brewing. Sam, thank you so much for this. It's always great catching up with you. Cheers. We appreciate it, brother. Cheers. Thanks, Mars. Thanks, Mal. Talk to you later.